focus on hitting your goals in every area of your business. Remember, the universe rewards the bold. A leader has to take the risks. Welcome to Wealth on the Beach podcast. This is Daniel Alonzo, and as always, I'm your host, bringing you some of the greatest minds in the world. And today, I got Mr. John Austinson. Did, did I say that right? I just want to make sure I got that right. Um, just like Austin, Texas, you got it, my friend. I love it. I love it. I love it. And uh, you are a consultant, investor, author, international speaker, and president of an Inc. 500 franchise system. I mean, you, I mean, this, this literally, this resume is a mile long. I love it. We got a lot of stuff to talk about today. Um, and, uh, and I really appreciate you coming on, John. Uh, let, let's, uh, let's talk about the non food franchising business. What's that all about, man? I was kind of like going, what, what's he talking about here? Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, the Inc. 500 franchise, or a, a, that was in my past life. And now, uh, you know, now I'm a multi brand franchisee. So I've sat on both sides of the table and get to spend most of my time on the consulting side. But no, you know, like so many of your listeners, Daniel, you know, I've got a background in the corporate world and had, you know, worked to climb the ladder and had a good run, but um, you know, had that entrepreneurial itch. And it was when I left the public company scene to step in with a private company, and that happened to be Shelf Genie Franchise System. I had the opportunity to come in and run the day-to-day -day operations, supporting all these small business owners or franchisees across North America. And for me, that was a pivotal, a pivotal experience, really opening up my eyes to, A, franchising being a better path to business ownership for a lot of people. And then secondly, this world of non-food franchising, as I've now dubbed it, where I don't always associate a franchising with fast food, as so many do. But um, you know, long story short, ended up partnering with the founder of Shelf Genie. We spun off. We've invested in franchises. I've had other partners. We've invested in franchises as franchisees. But, you know, but we've got, you know, I'm able to spend about 90% of my time now on the brokerage side because we have good people in place running our franchises. So, um, you know, I get to take clients through a process and really play matchmaker, helping them understand and then find the right opportunities in this world of what I call non-food franchising, which you know, when you look across North America, there are roughly 4,000 franchise brands. Half of those are in the food space and or lodging. We, we also don't work with hotels. Um, but the other half are in areas that I found 95% of my clients have the most interest in. Everything from home and property services to automotive to health and wellness and fitness to anything uh, that people are willing to spend money on. Kids, pets, health, homes. Um, you know, we, we have opportunities in each of those. So that's where we really go deep and, and focus. Well, what you're saying is that you guys uh, figure out how to play matchmaker between a franchise opportunity and uh, and and the person that might you know be interested. So you're 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 basically putting putting those people together. And so, like, where did that come from? Like, how did that begin for you? Why why, why did you choose that space versus? You know, you got a pretty ex extensive background. What 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 was it about that that interested you and got you excited about it? Yeah, you know, for me, it's it's rewarding. I love educating. I love being a subject matter expert in a niche and uh, you know carving out half the market. I, I just saw such a need out there. So many individuals have this desire innately to to be a business owner, to to build something of their own, their own empire, not someone else's. And you know, but they don't know where to start. And even on the franchising front, if you start googling around. You're going to see every brand putting their best foot forward online and their marketing messaging. We're able to see what's going on behind the scenes, you know, based on our experience, based on our relationships out there, we work with all the development groups, part of the largest brokerage system in the U S you know, we're fortunate. We do, you know, more deals than 99% of other brokerages. And uh, it allows us access to the opportunities before others get to them oftentimes. So, you know, we work with over 500 brands. We represent, you know, at any given time, there's probably 40 or 50 that I'm really, really a big fan of and can't wait to put in front of clients. Um, but it's, it's a great model. You know, our clients don't pay us a nickel and uh, we get paid by the franchisors on the back end, much like an executive search type uh, arrangement. For them, it's a sales and marketing cost and nothing gets passed on, on to our clients and really allows us to sit on the same side of the table as our clients and, and really educate and got them through the process. Cool, man. Well, you, you sound like a, I mean, again, just reading about you really interesting story. And, and I want our listeners, cause just so you know, I mean, you know, almost a hundred percent of our listeners are business owners, entrepreneurs, uh, you know, CEOs, you name it. 
And, uh, and I, I just, I kind of want to get to know you though, you know, know a little bit more about you. Where, where'd you come from, man? I mean, like, where did you grow up? Uh, what did your parents do? That kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as we were talking about before the show, I, we made the move from Jackson, Mississippi to Malibu, California. My father was in law school out there. And, um, you know, then we moved to Atlanta where we really settled in and, and I've lived most of my life, you know, here in the city with wife and three young kids, but but no, I was the oldest of four and my father was an attorney. So he was, he split off and was on his own. And, you know, he, he never made it big, but he invested in his kids. He, you know, gave us a great childhood and upbringing and, uh, you know, but a lot of lessons learned for me of, you know, how business ownership works. And I think he would have benefited by having a franchise system, you know, having that support um, that, that he didn't have, but no, you know, went through, I, I got out, did some international consulting uh, with Accenture, you know, went through grad school and, and again, did the corporate ladder and, uh, you know, really enjoyed it. You know, I, I can definitely live within those four walls. But there was something, just that itch that I wanted to scratch. And, and we're seeing that amongst so many out there today. And, you know, for those that are existing business owners, it, it is very common to, you know, want to build out that portfolio and look for other opportunities to either complement or diversify what you're currently doing. And, and we work with tons of business owners across the country that are looking to uh, to expand and oftentimes they don't know what they're looking for until they really start digging in what was your childhood like man yeah childhood so you know played sports uh you know did well in school um you know looking back you know just really was blessed to have a great childhood and you hear stories of others that don't and always feel for them and we try to give back now in ways to, to support others that may might not have had as strong of an upbringing but um, you know, that, that's a big piece of what we do. And I'm a big believer, Daniel, that to whom much is given, much is expected. And so if you've been given the opportunities and the, the education and the relationships and resources, it's not all about you and you've got to get back. So, you know, that manifests in different ways for my wife and I and, and what we try to do in the community and through some organizations. And I'm taking my 10 year old son. So we've got three kids, a 10 year old, six year old, and three year old, taking my 10 year old son down to, uh, down to Haiti this summer on a short-term mission trip and really excited about exposing him because I think we tend to live lives in the bubble and, you know, life really should happen when you get outside that bubble. So you now I, I had some of that exposure growing up and, uh, you know, but I was taught like so many, Hey, go earn a good W2 income and, and, you know, go to grad school and, you know, don't leave anything on the table, but I wasn't really taught entrepreneurship firsthand. Um, that was something that came kind of later in life and surrounding myself with people that had, made it or maybe we're a step or two ahead of me and I can learn both the good and the bad and the ugly from them, you know, learn from their mistakes as well. So, I mean, you know, in today's world, you know, having a college education, I talk a lot about this subject on the podcast because I'm always interested, you know, and, and again, I talk to highly educated people and people that have no education and so, or, you know, formal education. And so we talk about this because I'm always interested to hear, you know, the, the, the people that I'm interviewing, the guests on the show, you know, how you feel about college and kind of the state it is today and, you know, whether it's as important today as it was, you know, 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, I definitely think it, it helps. I'm not one of those that says, oh, screw college. At the same time, I think there are ways to go around it. I mean, I see firsthand the need in the market for the trades. And, you know, I think, gosh, if you're a young motivated person today and you want to get into the trades, I mean, you can name your price and you have a path to so much opportunity. So I think that's more alive today, especially in the labor market, the way it is. Um, so I'm a big, big fan and supporter of that. You know, I, I had a great college experience. And, and so I do, you know, there, there were memories, there were relationships to pull from that as well as just, you know, some discipline. Um, that, that I learned along the way too. So definitely a fan of it, but no, I look at our higher education system today and what the prices are and some of the things that are being taught in these classes. And um, yeah, definitely not a fan with the trajectory that, that it's moving in total. I mean, the, the truth is, is that most of everything today you can learn on YouTube. I mean, literally we are in a virtual school every single day of our life. I mean, there's probably not a day that I don't, a, a day of my life that I don't watch at least something on YouTube, something I want to learn, something I want to get educated about. 
Uh, somebody was asking me, uh, I, I trade options, one of the, the, the side things that I like to do. And, uh, and I'm, I'm decently successful at it. And, uh, and I had a friend yesterday, he called me up. He's like, Hey man, you know, give me some thoughts. Give me some, I'm like, dude, just watch this YouTube video, man. You're good. I, I learned so much and people will laugh at that because they'll say, well, wait a minute. You know, you don't have a, you're not college. Ed-. I mean, I made $40,000 last month, you know, from a cup, you know, punching a couple of buttons in my phone, uh, in my bed before eight o'clock in the morning. You know what I mean? So let's, yeah. let's, you know, let's, let's get this straight. I mean, there's a lot you can learn. And so I, and, and then, and then to just see the outrageous amount of money that the, the colleges want to charge these, these, you know, kids that are, you know, there's no way that most kids can spend $80,000 a year. So they've just priced, you know, even they'll give them a scholarship for 50000 it's still $30,000 out of their pocket. Yeah. Most people cannot uh, come up with that kind of money. So they're really pricing people out of the market. But, um, you know, so anyways, I, I get what you're saying. But at the same time, you want to be a doctor, attorney, lawyer. Obviously, you got to figure out what you got to do to, to, to make that happen in, in college. I mean, there's, there's always going to be a need for some sort of higher education. So, um, but I... Uh, what, what were you going to say? I was just going to say, I was with a group of doctors this morning, sit, you know, speaking and teaching them about this world of non-food franchising. It, it is fascinating what's going on in that industry as well. And just this desire to, uh, to get things going on the side, maybe a side hustle and, or make the career jump, you know, da- down the road. So we're seeing all sorts of backgrounds, you know, that, that we work with um, a lot of existing business owners too. So yeah, hundred percent. And a lot of our clients didn't go to college. Quite a few did. I mean, it really is, uh, a wide variety of those who are getting into the entrepreneurship. What kind of money do you need to start a franchise, generally speaking? Yeah. I'd say 75% of the deals that we do are between 125000 and 300000 Some are above that, some are below it. But, you know, Daniel, you probably know this well. I mean, there are different ways to get into it. Probably a third of our clients are self-funding because of the record levels of cash on the sidelines. Probably another third are using SBA loans. You know, that's a very, very common uh, instrument to use. And we have partners that help our clients with all these um, different types of programs. One other one uh, would be retirement uh, funding. A lot of folks are taking their IRAs or 401k, self-directing those through what's called a ROBS program, where they set up as a C-corp and then purchase the business with the retirement plan. Then I'm a big fan of portfolio loans. You know, this is a little hack that I came across myself recently, and you probably know about it. But, um, you know, for brokerage accounts that are non-retirement, you can borrow, you know, on margin essentially against those let those continue to grow you know, over time, but you can borrow 50, 60%. And right now I'm paying one and a half percent interest on those portfolio loans. And then I flip it into franchises or into real estate lending that I do on the side at 12 to 14%. And it's just, it's arbitrage. Very cool. Very cool. That's a, that's a great little tip right there. I mean, anybody just heard that. I mean, you just learned something big right now. That's a nice, nice little, uh, little piece of information. And so you, um, you know, there is a synergy, uh, I was reading uh, between um, uh, real estate investments and franchises, and you know, how savvy investors utilize it to their advantage. Can you maybe just expand on that a little bit? I mean, I've got real estate investments, I'd say 75% of my clients have real estate investments, you know, there are a couple of really I think that common trait, as you talk so eloquently about oftentimes is, you know, that semi-absentee or semi-passive executive model type. I, that's very common in franchising. Of course, that's what you're doing in real estate oftentimes. You're not out there necessarily you know, doing the maintenance yourself, but instead you're quarterbacking it. Um, so very, very similar. And in some cases, real estate clients of mine, uh, you know, whether or not they operate in the real estate field full time, and we do work with a lot of brokers and mortgage uh, bankers. Um, but those that have invested in real estate, they either say, hey, I'm looking to diversify my cor- current portfolio and create more semi-passive revenue streams, or maybe complement it. You know, I, I work with some that have several dozen rental homes or rental units, and they say, I'm paying a service provider today. Why not just pay? Um, you know, and, and businesses, I, I kind of joke that non sexy is the new sexy when it comes to industries. Um, you know, especially coming out of COVID, you know, people want things that are COVID resistant, Amazon resistant, in some deg- cases, uh, recession resistant. You know, things like 
serve pro, you know, water mitigation, mold remediation, or roll off dumpsters, or, you know, we've done three gutter steals recently, just a great business, fragmented market, $6 million billion industry. We just had a Wall Street attorney outside of Boston buy into a gutter business. No background in that space. Um, $52 billion insulation market. We've been doing a lot of deals in insulation. I'm an investor in a driveway company. Um, we don't even have to market it. There's such customer demands. You know, these types of businesses oftentimes work really well for real estate. But also, if you're a commercial real estate guy, you know, we, we've got a great you know, parking lot maintenance program. It does the line strapping. It fills potholes and resurfaces. I mean, things that you don't think about until you need to. Um, you know, things like oil changes. You know, we just did a 10 unit oil change deal where they use, uh, you know, prefabricated buildings in unused parking spaces of a retail shopping center backed by an investor group. You're able to get in for 125, 150, all in investment, including working capital. And then you're kicking out, you know, 330 revenue per location, about 30% bottom line. And so you get a couple of these going, it creates a great semi passive type rev revenue stream. So, so as far as ROI on that, I mean, what what type of returns are you, uh, are, are, I mean, generally, are, are you yeah. looking at per year net? Yeah. Yeah. And I speak in terms of net EBITDA after all expenses okay. paid, cost of goods sold, you know, operating expenses. So in the case of the, the oil change one I just mentioned, you know, you're, I mean, you're dropping 130 to the bottom line per year. You paid about 140, 150 to get in. So you extrapolate that. I mean, it's you're close to doubling your money. Um, and then of course, you're going to be able to sell it down the road. So you're building, you know, business exit value. The gutter business that I just mentioned that we've done three deals with recently, I mean, this one's been on fire and it's because the financial model behind it, all in investment, you're probably 175, 200 ish, including, you know, vehicle working capital, you know, franchise fee. Uh, so you're up and running and that business, they're averaging 1.7 million per location. And that's the great thing about franchising. You're not just using a pro forma on the back of a napkin. This is the average. Franchising is regulated by the Federal Trade Commission. You got to cross your T's, dot your I's in that franchise disclosure document. But across all their locations, 1.7 million average with about a 30% bottom line. So that's not a 30% return. That's drop in, you know, call it 550,000 or so to the bottom line. Now that's if you're running the business. If you were paying an operator run the business, you're probably paying them, call it 100,000 or so, but that's still dropping 400, 450 to the bottom line on a business that you paid 200 for, and you're going to be able to sell it down the road. So it's eye-opening to people once they realize some of the riches in the niches. And so um, when you think about, uh, you know, the, the pros and the cons of franchising versus starting a company from scratch, touch on that a little bit. Yeah, you know, and I'd start out by saying franchising is not right for everyone. You know, I have clients, uh, I'm a member of the entrepreneurs organization. You know, some of those clients are too entrepreneurial and they want to put their thumbprints all over it and don't want to stay within the lines. However, for so many, and I'd say the majority, even existing business owners, they say, hey, I love the idea of starting on third base instead of first base because I'm not testing product market fit day one. Instead, I know the path to profitability. I've got a playbook. And now it's just about executing that playbook. You know, you've got a coach on the sidelines in that franchise or the better you do, the better they do. So, you know, they're supporting you along the way. You've got franchisees in other markets that are living the same thing day in, day out. You know, you're in business for yourself, but you're not by yourself because you're constantly exchanging best practices and learnings around marketing vehicles or, you know, best places to hire talent, you know, items like that. Um, and then you're also building an asset that's going to have exit value, as I mentioned. And Daniel, a really interesting study came out recently by the Riker School of Business. They looked at 2,000 businesses, franchised and non-franchised in like-kind industries, and compared their exits, uh, about, about 2,000 businesses over a 10-year period. And they found that those that were franchised traded at a multiple upon their exit at about one and a half times non-franchise. And so there's value on that resale piece down at the end, of the end of the line as well. And I mean, from a success rate standpoint, we all know startups, you know, five years down the road, less than 10% are still in business, whereas on average, a little over 90% of franchises are still in business. So it doesn't totally de-risk it, but it certainly does mitigate the risk a good bit. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and as far as like, how much work do I got to put in, man? I mean, you know, I... I I'm all about, you know me, I'm all about passive income, man. I want passive income. I want cash flow. I want money 
I want, you know, uh, mailbox money. So what, uh, you know, how much, I mean, legitimately, like no bullshit, right? Like yeah. how much work do I got to put in here? I always tell people if they think it's going to take 10 hours a week, it's probably going to take 15, you know, 15, it'll probably take 20. It's going to take a little bit more than whatever you think it is going in. You know, that's just life. Um, but it comes down to getting a good general manager that you can put in place day one that's going to run those operations. Um, I've got a client of mine, uh, Nathan Bocock, who, great guy, 39 years old. He's become the largest franchisee of two men in a truck moving service, operates in 10 markets, $30 million plus annual business. And he and I've done a couple of deals together the past few years where, I mean, he, he's a busy guy, but he keeps picking up more businesses in the franchise realm. And he'll put a young general manager in place. In his case, he actually provides them with some equity and incentivizes them. And I mean, he's just had a great track record of not having to put much time into these businesses. He'll get on a couple of coaching calls every week or two, but that's it. Um, and so I've now got him coaching my clients. So once I have a client move forward with an opportunity, before they launch, I set them up with Nathan for a couple of coaching calls and he shares best practices on where do you find the general manager, how do you set them up for success. Um, I mean, it's something that I've seen across the board with clients. I've done it myself. I mean, we've got a 27 year old running that driveway business that I mentioned. You know, we recently acquired two other franchise locations and I mean, he's off to the races. His background, he was a CPA, five years in a big four accounting firm. He said, I'm ready to break out of these four walls and go, go build something. And and we actually let him buy into a little bit of equity. So he has some skin in the game and Daniel, he's killing it. Absolutely killing it. And it's just fun. And so we'll, our level of involvement right now, just firsthand, we'll get on a weekly call. We'll get together for beers once a month. Uh, you know, my partners and in, in our GM and myself, and then we do text a good bit, uh, you know, throughout the week, you know, but it's more at the strategic level or him sharing updates with us. Um, we recently sponsored a NASCAR, which was a lot of fun. Never had done that before and you know, had it wrapped with the driveway business. And, and so we're just having a good time and the, and the thing is growing and uh, profitable and it's off to the races. That's fun. That's fun. Yeah. It, it's, it's exciting to look, I don't care what business you're in. I mean, it's exciting to see people winning. It's exciting to see people have success and having fun. I mean, what's the point if we can't have a little bit of fun and we can't enjoy ourselves and, and come on, I mean, a couple of text messages throughout the week, a couple of calls during, during the week. I mean, that doesn't seem very uh, crazy or taxing to me. So uh, t talk about the failures, man. I mean, there's gotta be some downfall to this stuff, or there's gotta be some failures, even for, I mean, just you personally, I mean, yeah. tell me about some of the bad things that have happened. Yeah. In, in the past? No, definitely. You know, from a client standpoint, I've only had one client where it hasn't worked out, where they've thrown in the towel. I mean, it's just, we, we've been very fortunate. We've had a great success record here. And in most cases, clients come back and buy additional locations or, or ex additional businesses. But no, we did have one guy, he lived outside of Nashville, about three hours outside, and he bought a mosquito business in Nashville. And this was one that, uh, you know, it was a great system. There's a business that, you know, I think out, out of the ground, you know, if you could get some grassroots efforts, you know, friends and family putting up yard signs or just making some referrals, you know, some test trials out of the gate, that it's a business that would be benefited by that. And so about three or four months in, he, he lived three hours outside the market, didn't have contacts in the market. He said, this is going to be a little too much effort for me. You know, I, I'm not sure it's going to get to where I want it to be, at least not fast enough. And so he threw in the towel and, you know, left on good terms. Um, so that was my kind of one, you know, that didn't work out. On the personal side, you know, we've had a, a good record. There is one and it, that I've taken a lot of learnings from, and that was a partnership setup where I had two partners. And as you know, partnerships are great till they're not. And, um, you know, in this case, uh, the guy, I was long-term friends with one of the guys. We brought in another guy as our operating partner. Um, you know, we let him essentially have a third of the business buying to a third. And um, he was not the right fit. And we didn't realize that until a little bit late. And he had been giving us reports that, hey, the business is growing. It's doing great on the revenue side, but he hadn't been managing expenses or managing our marketing costs. And so once we kind of pulled back the coverage, we said, oh, wait a minute, we, we don't, you've lost our trust. We, we can't have you running the business going forward. So we had to get him out. At the same time, my other partner became the operating partner, but that's not what he signed up for in the beginning. And so to incentivize him, I had to sell my equity to him at a little bit of a loss. Um, but lots of learnings. Of course, there's drama around that. And, you know, it doesn't sound that terrible now, but, you know, when you're living in the moment, you know, it's not fun. And 
Uh, fortunately, I've been able to draw some lessons from the setup that we had and lack of contingency planning that now we've put into agreements that I've done or my clients have done. Well, that's uh, the lessons of life, man. I mean, I had, I had two fathers and I've learned things from both of them. You know, they're all their failings, all their, you know, uh, not good stuff. I took all the good and I, you know, kept, I, I kept it in me and I left all the bad, right? I mean, everything that, that, that was every failure, every disappointment, every, right? And, and again, that's how we learn. And, and you know, even, even investments. I mean, I've had investments where, you know, you, you throw something in with a, with a partner and it just doesn't go the way it's supposed to go and you lose. I mean, I've lost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars through the years uh, just trying to become successful, trying to succeed. And, uh, but I think that uh, what I love about the franchise model is the fact that um, it is, you know, very, uh, th there's a lot of passivity to it. So that's what I love. Um, but I also love the system part because I'm a systems guy. I love to build systems and I love to have systems. I mean, what helped me in my business throughout all these years was in 1999, I, I opened up my first location and, uh, and I, the first thing I did, and nobody did this back in 1999. We didn't have YouTube. We didn't have websites. We didn't have, you know, again, it was especially in our type of business, nobody did this and I, man, but I built systems, man. I, I put everything on video. I put it, it was DVD back then, everything on tape cassette back then. And I just started handing them out to all my agents every single week. I'd be selling them my little tapes for $2, by the way, I wasn't trying to get rich. I just wanted them to get really competent and confident in what they were doing. And today we have a 1500 person organization, 50 locations. And, um, and it was all because, and, and you're shaking your head. Yes. If you're listening to the podcast, he's shaking his head. Yes. Cause he knows what I'm talking about is systems are everything. Tell me about that, John. Yeah. And I was going to say, I mean, kudos to you and whether or not you, I mean, we have a lot of businesses that are now franchised and they love the idea of, you know, scaling quickly using other people's money who also have skin in the game. All those things you just said and private equity loves franchising. I mean, they're acquiring franchises right and freaking left right now at the franchisor level, typically. Um, you know, if you Google that, you'll just see all that activity. And so it can be a great way for businesses to scale themselves through franchising. We just, we just helped a chiropractic clinic go through the franchise process. We helped a flooring business go through the franchise process. We have some great partners to kind of come in on and, and partner on that. Um, but no, I always encourage companies, you know, within the entrepreneurs organization or elsewhere, think of yourself as a franchise, even if you choose not to franchise, because exactly what you just said, you know, what, if you put yourself in someone else's shoes coming in from the outside, you know, what training do you have to have in place? What systems and manuals and processes, what staffing and support personnel, just thinking about your business from that uh, standpoint of if we did move to a new location or a new customer base, what does that look like? It's going to make you better for it. Um, but no, if, you know, going back to what we're talking about, if you're an entrepreneur today or looking to be an entrepreneur and you want to expand and add in a side hustle or business that you know, maybe early on you can put in 15 to 20 hours a week, but over time you really want to scale that back to even call it five or less hours a week, which is definitely doable with the right person in place. You know, wouldn't you rather know that you're that, that manager you put in place isn't out there on their own you, with your support, but instead you've got another set of eyes. You've got that franchise or also watching them their support team is supporting them, helping them, keeping them going down the path. So it's not, the burden isn't entirely on you. Instead, you've got them in a system where if they execute and they're being guided by that franchisor, it increases the odds of success and allows you to really relax on the beach, as, as you like to say. So what's that advice, man, you'd give your younger self? I mean, what, what would you tell yourself, you know, 16-year-old self, man? Any, any, any tips? Yeah, you know, the, the chances I took, the risk I took along the way, which, you know, never were that crazy risky, but, you know, the little ones I took, you know, I don't regret any of those, the ones that worked out, the ones that didn't, you know, the things I learned from, you know, business partner of mine back in the day used to say, fail fast, you know, and, and so things that didn't work out or asking the girl out or, you know, what have you, I'm glad I did. And, you know, I think that I'm better for it and I've learned lessons, but, you know, been very blessed to you know, kind of figure out things as we go and learn from others and, you know, we're now in a position where, you know, my siblings and I are supporting our parents, you know, in a small way. I mean, it's not substantial at this time, but, 
you know, it, I, I think of instead of their investing in assets, they invested in their kids. Those were their assets. And now we're paying, able to pay dividends back and support them. And it kind of, you know, goes around. So it's neat to think about too, just the impact you can have in your community. And when you think about from a stewardship standpoint, I mean, you've been very successful, you know, you're teaching others, you know, through this program, you're guiding others. There's so many things that you personally do. Um, you know, but how I, I've come across a lot of successful business owners that say, hey, I love it. I wouldn't trade anything, but I'd love to help others do what I did and use my learning. So it's not just you know, on me. And so we have quite a few folks that will, again, I kind of keep saying a young GM. That's just what I see oftentimes. It's somewhere in their 20s that's hungry. And they say, hey, I'm going to set them up for success. I'm going to help them not make the same mistakes I've learned from along the way and, and you know, coach them up. And I'll put a little skin in the game and invest in them, you know, put some equity in. They'll put in sweat equity. That's a great model. You know, it works out more often than not. So um, very doable, something I think for a lot of people to think about. Glad you talked about that because, I mean, giving back and I, I wrote a, a little piece in, in, in the brand new book, Wealth on the Beach. Just, oh, by the way, we just launched it and uh, it's out in on Amazon now. So I'm excited about that. The paperback, the ebook. And uh, you know, what's kind of fun is we were number one new book launched on Amazon in the financial services category. So I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm excited huge. about that. Yeah, it's Congrats. a big deal, man. Number yeah. one, baby. That and so um, we are, but, but no, I wrote a little bit about it and, and I wrote this little piece that, that talked about um, somebody's going to need us one day. You know, you, you talked about your parents and my mom, she's been handling my, she pays all my bills. She makes sure all my taxes are paid. She makes sure all my, my financial software is updated and all that good stuff. And she always used to look at me and, you know, or, you know, when I'd be on the computer with her and she'd say, you know, why do you save so much money? You know, like, why, why do you, like, how come you don't go spend more? Why don't you go buy some Lamborghinis or go buy some Rolls Royces and, or buy an even bigger house, you know? And, uh, and I said, because mom, one day somebody's going to need me, you know, somebody's going to, I'm going to have to write a check one day. And it's, uh, it's wild because uh, just about two months ago, we had a family member that, was going to die. I mean, literally had a, had an issue, a health issue. Uh, there was a very good possibility. He's very sick. He was becoming sick and he was going to, you know, it, it could have been fatal. And, um, and there, it's not something that you can just get a loan for, you know, I mean, a lot of times, you know, certain medical procedures, you have to do it, you know, right. You have to write a check. I mean, full, they, they need all of the money. And, uh, and that's exactly what happened. And, and we were able to write that check. And uh, today he's, you know, a couple months later, he's doing so much better. I mean, his life is like completely changed. His health is dramatically better. And, but I'm, I'm glad you talked about that because even my parents, you know, they're looking for a new home and they were kind of a little iffy on which one to buy because my, my dad's retiring. And, and I said, don't worry about it. Get up, get the nicer one. You know what I mean? Like get the nice one. If I need to, to pitch in some cash every month to make sure the mortgage is taken care of, then, then let's do it. Cause I want to do it. like, that's why I saved my money. That's why I work so damn hard all those years. That's why I, I, I invested. That's why I get up every day and I still invest. That's why I still make good choices about my finances is because one day somebody's going to need me. And so does that, does that kind of make sense a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And, and I think that's something we don't talk that much about in total. And, you know, I was talking with some business owners yesterday and that's maybe why the thoughts, you know, fresh in my mind, but we're talking about exactly what you're saying. And, and a lot of our parents are now getting at that stage of life where maybe they haven't saved up enough. I mean, unfortunately it's extremely common out there. And so it is neat to position you know, yourself to not only support your own family, your immediate family, but also extended family. And I mean, that's what it's all about. So. Well, this was fun, John. Uh, excited to meet you. And uh, I'm in Atlanta, maybe once or twice yeah. a year. So uh, who knows? Maybe we'll have uh, we'll have lunch one of these days. And of course, if you're ever out in California, man, hit me up and let's go do coffee, lunch, dinner, whatever. Uh, I, I know a lot of people right now. They're kind of thinking, "Wow, this sounds really cool." And uh, you know, I got this little 401k that I need to know what to do with. And, you know, it's kind of just sitting there and, you know, the market's tanking right now, by the way. And, and we, we are in a, in a recession, at least the early days 
uh, of a, a recession. And so, you know, this might be an idea. I'm not selling this to anybody, but this might be an idea for somebody to investigate. So they need to know how to get a hold of you, John. How can we make that happen? Yeah, easy step. Come out to our website, franbridgeconsulting.com. That's F-R-A-N, bridgeconsulting.com. Sign up for our monthly newsletter. We'll give you some great content to start thinking about. We'll also make sure that all of your listeners get a copy of our book that comes out in, in the third quarter, uh, the book on non-food franchising. So really excited about the work that's gone into that. And I uh, would love to give a copy to, to all of your listeners. Um, and then if this is an area that you'd like to take a next step and learn a little, little bit more about, I'd be happy to jump on even a 10 or 15 minute call um, so sign up for our newsletter. We'll, we'll ping you, see if you'd like to connect and, uh, you know, see if it makes sense to jump in and, and partner on this. So love helping people. And uh, it's just been fun to look back and see all those that we've been able to put into business ownership or help them expand uh, their, their ownership over time. So I would love to engage with those that have an interest. We appreciate you, John. Um, as always, everybody, hey, look, you know, make sure that if you have not checked out his website or Instagram or Facebook or Google him, whatever you need to do, he's out there, okay? Um, and it's John O S T E N S O N. Um, go check him out, you know, reach out, connect with him. You know, he, he'll, he'll answer your questions. You want to know more? I, you know, I don't even know everything about what he's doing. So, you know, if I have an interest, then I'm going to reach out and say, what's up? You know, the beautiful thing, I just want just kind of closing out here with everybody. The beautiful thing about a podcast or, or social media today is that literally people are now closer than ever. I mean, the world is so connected today. So don't be afraid, you know, don't be shy. Don't be embarrassed to reach out, to ask somebody for advice or ask for help. Believe it or not, the most successful people in the world, they love talking about what they do. They love explaining what they do. They love, I mean, come on. I mean, John's a pretty successful dude. I mean, probably, you know, obviously he's trying to expand his business and be successful. We all do. But the truth is he's doing pretty good right now. He doesn't mind helping somebody or lifting somebody up to that next level if he can. Uh, and if you're the right motivated type of person. Um, but if you have good questions, man, reach out and, and, and ask those questions. And then look, um, you know, if you still have not gotten a copy of Wealth on the Beach, uh, 11 Universal Laws to uh, Creating and Building Financial Freedom, you need to go do that. Amazon, go do it. But most important thing and look i you're all my listeners and and you're on the checking me out on youtube do me a huge favor leave a review on amazon most important thing leave a review picture with you and the book all right so uh, we want to see your face we want to know who you are and and send me all those pictures send them to my uh, i answer all my dms on instagram send them out to me let's connect let's be friends and with that said uh, you know, continue to dream bigger, get after it, but most importantly, do it now. God bless you. We will see you at the top.